Formula Access, welcome. We've got a really um, different episode today than you were expecting. Uh, we got a late night email uh, from an unknown team for an unknown guest. And we today have Rashab. You guys, I'm actually really excited about this episode. Uh, we recorded it a couple of months ago. And Rashab is one of those guys uh, with Mercedes that is just very, very motivated for young people to enter the sport. He's uh, extremely smart and just has a heart for young people getting into the sport and a wealth of knowledge and just an amazing storyteller. Uh, we, we got into his family and uh, just being a young guy, uh, figuring out what you want to do in life and you know how that impacts your mom and dad and uh, when when those plans uh, involve one of the most challenging industries in the world, uh, he's just he's an example of setting out for a goal and chasing it until you accomplish it. You guys, I'm actually really really excited. Rashab is just one of those guests that uh, I really enjoyed speaking with, and uh, have really enjoyed kind of messaging back and forth since we recorded a couple months back. So, you guys, enjoy. Formula Access, welcome. Told you I would bring the people of motorsports to your doorstep. I found another title that we've never worked with, we've never had on the show. Uh, today we have a special guest, Rashab. He is with Mercedes, and he is a cost analyst in the Composite Design Group. Rashab, man, thank you. Thank you for responding to my messages and coming on and telling us about your role. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you so much for inviting in the first place. Uh, yes, so by the way, I'm, I'm Rishabh. Uh, so my title is Composite Design Cost Analyst. So the main job of me is working with the budget cap as easy as it sounds. So because you guys know in 2020, uh, Formula One has, FIA has introduced something called as a budget cap where every team is only allowed to spend a certain amount of money. So this is where this group cost analysis has been formed. Uh, so now we have a team which looks into the engineering side of things in terms of the budget cap situation and we make an estimation to see how we can increase the performance of the car by minimizing the amount of money that we spend. And I work in the composite design section, so all the bits which go into the car, especially chassis, aero, anything which has carbon fiber on it goes through me. Okay. Cost cap. Okay, you you are going to unlock something I have no <laughs> idea and when I write I am guessing. Yeah. So in the cost cap we're we're going to go elementary school go. here. <laughs> you guys don't have like 145 million dollars in a bank account where you like you spend it and when it's gone it gets overdrafted and you get penalized. It's it's a really, really complex set of rules in and of itself, much like what you see on the engineering side or kind of the rules of car design. Is, is that true? Yeah, it is kind of the, the, it's kind of that way, to be honest. So because it's not like every team is given 150 pounds. It's just that whatever money you spend on the car should be equivalent to 150 pounds, 150 million pounds or 150 million dollars, whatever the terminologies they use right now, but whatever the X amount of money which has been allocated to the team. So as simple as it sounds, you start with zero. That means you have spent zero money on the car. While you go through the season, you make parts, you make parts, you make parts, and you document every single part that is going onto the car, which then adds up, adds up, adds up, adds up. And by the end of the season, which is Abu Dhabi race, this sum of money which you see over here should not exceed the cap, which was $145 million for the thing was last season. And for this season, it would be $5, $5 million less. I think it's around 135 to 140, depending on the number of races increased, decreased, all those uh, rules which have been included over there. So it is literally like you document the values and you make sure 
the amount of money you spent on the car is less than that cap by the end of the season. So FIA is going to ask you only about it at the end, but not at the start. Wow. So like anything with a composite design, that's that's your responsibility, like carbon fiber. Yeah, mostly. So metals. we have certain divisions in terms of who decides to work on where. So I specifically work on composite design and composite production a bit. So it's literally like whatever new designs which go onto the car, uh, we make an understanding of how much money we spent on this particular piece of equipment just to understand how much money we spent towards the end. So it's just that we are over here to make sure working with the engineers, they don't make decisions based only on performance, but also based on the cost, if that makes sense. So before it used to be, yeah. So before every team has unlimited amount of money in a way, because sponsors have loads of money, which just going into F1. So if, if they have to make a new front wing, they'd be like, yeah, let's just make 10 of them or seven of them, or depending on how many they want. But now you can't do that. You are, you tend to think differently. You'd be like, instead of making an entire new wing, why don't we just make bits of it? Why don't we just make this? Is it actually, you know, efficient to make a wing with this much amount of money, spending this much and not getting the performance? So before it was only about performance, even though they had a slight amount of increase in the downforce, they'd be like, yes, let's do it. But now, no, no, no. You just need to be like, <laughs> you need to think in terms of performance, in terms of cost, in terms of labor, whatever factors comes related to money, because the world runs on money. You know, And coming with the cost cap, you need to make sure every single bit is as efficient as possible so that you can get the most out of the performance as well. So when, when you think about your role as an analyst, like you're not, you're not building the parts, you're not involved in the CNC, the CAD design, any of that. You're involved in um, analyzing the component parts, the actual cost of the parts within your group. But are you also, like, are you also putting feelers out there globally as far as like supply chains, transportation? Like, obviously, you have to procure the the components of whatever you're you're building or you're over. Like that whole kind of that's all your baby through the whole season, mm -hmm. and you have to understand how you know shipping costs affect your impact on the budget. Um, you know, raw materials that, I mean, you're in all of that. Right? So ultimately from start to finish. So from a part being a brick of metal to the part being the part itself, everything is included in as a money to invest into the, into a part. So all of that is considered and I'm not heavily involved in the procurement side of things, but I do have an idea how much is actually cost. So there's a certain way of understanding between us and the procurement team, how we actually maintain a cost. So I know, I know whenever I need to understand, just say I need to estimate how much this part costs. So I know what's actually happening, how much it may or may not be there. So we make an understanding before we make, before we make a part, how much is actually costing. So, so we understand actually, I mean, are you, yeah, go on. <clears throat> Are, are you in the innovation side of it too? Because I would imagine, are you looking at outside of the box materials as well? Like you don't have to get into like what they are, but like if, you know, if we're running, you know, a aluminum plate on the car and we realize that carbon fiber is, is different or more cost effective mm -hmm. and lighter, you know, are you looking at that as well? No, I, I won't be involved in certain decisions involved in the car because we are not allowed to impact something which goes onto the car. We are excluded from the cost cap. So cost analysts, as it sounds, are excluded from the cost cap. So we don't, we are not allowed to make any decisions on the car or to make any designs, any nothing. Our only role is to understand how much it actually costs. And just try to improve and is performance it just the raw by the end of like, uh, try to increase the performance through the cost perspective side of things. 
you're like the policeman with the radar gun on the side of the street. <laughs> you're just making sure that we understand how much this costs and we keep Toto out of the media fire. Exactly. Right? That's as easy as it sounds. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> all right i i gotta like dumb everything down yeah, so, that's all right so that's all. it's it's a bit it of an under like yeah. it's a bit of a confusion because it's a very new thing which has been introduced in f1 and even every team is still trying to understand what exactly people what, how exactly people can actually implement this thing called cost analysis or whatever it is what do you call the so-called financial engineering so people are slowly slowly realizing that they need this role is actually important for a team to grow and it's still under a lot of you know, what do you call it's not known to people a lot even in f1 like it's still go- coming through going through as we go through years people understand that this is actually a big thing and then hopefully the entire team gets to know more to be honest by the end of season or in a couple of years whenever it is do you, do you guys look at components <clears throat> like for example we we had a you know we had a couple of people from uh Red Bull power trains on here and we were talking about like when they're obviously you know it gets built on a CAD machine you know and then they a CAD drawing mm-hmm. and then they actually CNC it they build it construct it take it off to wind tunnel when when you like if you are looking at a part like that like let's take a front wing yep front wing for example you know it's designed it's handed Mm -hmm. off it's manufactured or constructed it's taken over to the the wind tunnel are you looking at like how long is that thing you know how long does it take to be built is the manpower behind you know that employee's salary associated with i mean is it really that detailed or is it like this is a $10,000 Ten thousand dollars of carbon fiber and so let me break. So let me let me break it down. Uh, break this down to you as easy as possible. So okay. you have the front wing. We literally break it. Talk to me like I'm a child. We literally break it down to every single nut and bolt, and every single part is still broken down from raw material to this much labor in terms of how many hours he has actually spent to this much labor how many hours is actually seen for quality or whatever it is so every single bit that part goes through everything is documented everything is seen in terms of how much money we are spending on it minute by minute when i say minute by minute it is minute by minute and see how much exact penny we actually spent on the car that's fascinating i I've actually written a lot about this because it is so complex. It's not, you know, we don't have $150 million in a bank account. We're running payroll. We're buying stuff through procurement. And then we have salaries and benefits and food and and travel and, and those types of deals. I, It's fascinating how you guys break it down so deeply. And obviously, you, you guys as a team did – did well you played within the rules which is good and and i just like i i would imagine it's like trying to file a really complicated tax return you know a, a corporate tax return a personal it's really easy but corporate tax returns obviously you have to hire professionals and i think you know to me that's that's what your role is 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 to to help navigate that do you guys get and maybe not do you but is there gray area in this rule? Like, I don't want to say like, is Mercedes have gray area to play around with? But I mean, is it really crystal clear on how that maybe that's what it is? Is it clear enough to to operate? Or is it like, I don't know? I mean, what do you think? It is still it is still a it is still a new role. Because until now, what's happening is you had design, the manufacturing bits, and then you have finance. So finance generally deals with as you tell the tax returns and everything. But now, because of the budget cap, finance doesn't have an understanding of engineering. Engineering doesn't have an understanding of finance. We as cost analysts in the middle are the mediators between the both. So as easy as it sounds, (laughs) we do financial engineering. So getting to understand how we can operate, we can, so engineering is all about performance, right? Finances, they didn't have a limit. 
in engineering, the limit was the design itself. The, what do you call it? The rule book is the limit. And you try to go to the limit. Finance didn't have a limit. Now the cost cap is the limit. So you try to maximize the potential. But how do you maximize potential over here, which is the engineering side on the finances? That's what we do. If that makes sense. It makes perfect yeah. sense. I've been in sales my whole yeah. life and I have battled accounting and legal mm -hmm. my entire career. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, we want to do this deal, you know, and legal is like, well, you got to do this, yeah. you know, and we have to add these things in here and accounting's like, yeah, you can't afford it. Raise the price. Or, you know, I, I, I totally, I totally get what you're talking yeah. about, <laughs> at least for my path. How, how big is this group? Like how many people like you, yeah, it, it, is, it is literally, you... uh, it's, it's not a big group to be honest. It's still a small group of like 12 people or something. So everybody looks at different parts of the car, but then we don't operate as our own group. We operate with several groups, like from people from procurement, people from finance, people from planning, project engineers. So even though we are a small group term cost analyst, everybody has a different role, which in, indirectly affects the entire company. So this role, this group was only created just to navigate between finance and engineering, give certain decisions to, you know, the same thing again, financial engineering status over here, but then still work as a team with all the departments, with planning, project engineers, procurement, operations, design, finance. We all bring them out together and be like, okay, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, this is happening, put them all together. So it's not a team of 10 people, it's a team as a team. So that's the beauty of F1. It's every single thing is impacted for the entire company. I mean, it's not like you do something, you leave it. It's not, you're, you're out of thing. No, no, no. You do something until the last stage if some, somebody or the other is impacted. So if we never say we are like a small team. Of course, of course, we do our bits on our own. We do have our own team meetings and stuff, but ultimately you need to talk to every single department just to make things right, just to get the best out of things. Does, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to tread really lightly yeah. here. <laughs> do you, okay. Does anyone ever come to you and they're like, Hey, do you see this thing on the car? Like on, you know, on the Haas, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think that costs? I mean, do you guys actually look at as much as you, as much as you can, do you look at other cars to kind of help maybe the sport self governs itself. I mean, every team, it's, it's, it's ultimately it's a competition. Every team looks at other yeah. people's cars, no matter what, no matter what you say or not say. So even though, Don't touch. even though it's just like, <laughs> we, we might be like, okay, or whatever it is, but ultimately in the background, people get influenced by their competitors, hook or crook, no matter what it is. But the way we implement things, everything is on our th on our basis because ultimately we don't have any authority over what other teams are doing, and we don't know what documents they submit. They don't know what documents we submit. Only the FIA knows, and we don't have any control. Not even we don't even know what they are doing. So ultimately, even if we be like, oh yeah, they are doing this, they are doing this, it's still in vain because we just need to focus on our roles and just be like, we should be under the cost cap. End of story. That's the entire thing that we do. <laughs> You're a nice competitor because I would be like, that That looks expensive. I mean, hey, you know, check this out. <laughs> I don't want to raise, I don't want to say anything over here. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to mute you here and not let you talk. I, <laughs> I've, uh, yeah. I actually like I've been I've been fascinated by this whole topic mm -hmm. of cost cap, not from a who's doing yep. what, but more so just Formula One itself has grown so fast and it's it's firing on all cylinders. It's doing everything right. And like any business, when those things happen, it exposes things we didn't quite think out while we were defining out how, how are we going to, you know, enter America? How are we going to have 26 races in a season? And 
how are we going to add these new venues? How are we going to have, you know, uh, carbon reduction initiatives and things like that? A cost cap, you know, a, a cost cap, the teams will always break mm-hmm. it and not go over it, but they'll find all of the problems in it. And, you know, and there'll always be, you know, edits every yeah. year of like, okay, well, now we can't do this because we've identified it's too complicated or not complicated enough, whatever that is. It's to me, it's been the most fascinating story of Formula One in a really long time because fundamentally it's made it a profitable business mm-hmm. for teams to come in. And I think that's why you're seeing Audi and Porsche come in and say, I don't care what it costs to acquire a team. Yep. We want it. And, you know, if we got to build one, we'll build one because they make money and they have eyeballs. Yep. And so, man, I, I to, to be honest, I'm so much more excited about your role. But, but to be honest, <laughs> on, on, on the basis of when you say profitability, if you see, look at even I'm not sure how much the company makes or whatever, because that's not my role. That's finances thing to do. But whatever I've gathered in terms of right. through YouTube or whatever it is. Formula One is not about profit. It's just marketing, to be honest. Not not joking. Formula One is all about competition, innovation, right. marketing. Nothing else. Because Formula One gives you the scope of the best engineers that you have. Every resources that they can get. And they can make whatever they want. There is no limit. Whether as an automotive, there's always a certain barrier of you can't do this, you can't do that. Because you make n number of cars. But over here, you make one car and you try to push, push, push in terms of what you can make. So that's why like even ERS and everything, F1 developed it a lot more. Now it's used in automotive cars. So F Formula One provides that platform for teams, even though, I mean, they make profit, but not, not as, it's not much to be honest, uh, as much as I've gathered. So it's just that teams are able to, you know, market themselves with this whole community of millions of people, plus give the engineers a taste of what they are, they can provide with all the equipment that they can have. And if they make something innovative, use that in a road car, rather than putting invest of money in a road car or whatever it is. So there are a lot of inventions done in Formula One, which is used in real life automotive industry, like safety or performance or whatever it is. That is what Formula One is, it's not, but it, yeah. But it levels the competition. Yeah. It levels the competition, you know. And I, 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 if I'm, you know, if I'm Ryan and mm-hmm. I want to start a Formula One team and I've got three hundred million dollars yep. and I go to the I go to the grid and Mercedes, Ferrari, and Red Bull are all spending, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred million dollars yep. a year. It's really tough for me to compete yep. in that environment. Whereas when it's all even. Mm-hmm. Now it's innovative minds and the meritocracy, which is what I love in Formula One is the best, brightest, most creative people on the planet. And in my opinion, I've not met one person on this show that I'm not just like in awe of (laughs) yourself included. Like you guys are just like corporate rock stars. Oh man, trust me. (laughs) It is is, the only way I can explain what you do. It is literally just another job, not joking. But like in in all seriousness, like most corporations and most businesses don't have, I don't know, call it 99.9% high performing Mm -hmm. personalities and and dedication, you know, and that's the team environment. But like you could go to a business and find, you know, 50% of the staff is on Amazon, (laughs) you know, when you walk down the office and facebook and and whatnot but i just i envision you guys are all sitting at the office till eight o'clock at night you know and you're all just like you're sleeping innovation you're sleeping the edge you're sleeping cost cut no that that that's a big you know i would say a myth in formula one people do work long hours people do work that thing but people whenever they're off work like especially like even that when they're having breakfast or having lunch People enjoy their time over there. They just keep talking to people. When when you're off that computer, you are just a normal person again. Even if there's like total wolf for whoever's coming in, they just come in and talk to people like it's normal. And when the, when I first joined, in, I'm like, 
no this is not normal toto wolf cannot be talking to normal people but that's how it is <laughs> like f1 engineers okay they have this high performance mind because it's exciting because you are doing something which is happening in front of your eyes which is affecting this millions of amazing motorsport industry but i've seen this like i when i first joined f1 i was like okay it's going to be hard hectic it's going to be work all day all night no it's not it's my work life balance from my previous company to now it's 1000 times better right now my work life balance is incredible i'm not even joking like when i work i'm on i'm on it i don't waste a single minute of my time but when i'm off my desk even going to have a coffee i just sit for 15 minutes have have some rest 15 30 minutes talk to people do whatever i want recharge myself go back and then everybody's on it again so i i get that i get that about mercedes i i i really as a business leader from the outside looking in and talking to people inside the team i I think that you can have a really really strong work mm-hmm. ethic and also be able to balance yeah. that. I think Jeff Bezos said it was work life harmony mm-hmm. versus balance because balance means it's either one or yeah. the other. You know, and I think I I I gather that that you guys all balance your time really really well, which is why you're able to innovate at such an enormous pace. Yeah. I mean this year this race perfect example <laughs> yeah it didn't look like this the first race oh. you know and most teams are generally flatlined mm-hmm. you know whatever you bring to the to Bahrain that's what you've got yeah. all season you know and and you guys just grinded 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 and one two yeah, i mean people i could see go. like people grinding how much ever like how much ever they can just to make you know that limit make it higher like you could literally see the concentration on people's faces whenever they work it's it's incredible like like they work as they work but when but when it's normal like when it's when people start to talk they just talk they just chill it's like what's happening how will they have changed from this mindset to this i don't know about myself because i don't see myself in a mirror i just work and i talk but when i see in other people's faces i'm like this is this is so good like my manager himself He's always in a meeting. He's always doing this, but then he comes around. He's like, "Want to grab a cup of coffee?" He's like, "Yeah, let's go. Just go. We sit in the we sit in the canteen. We just chill for fifteen, twenty minutes, laugh about life, and then just go back and then grind back to grind again. And we don't. That's a, the best part is I, the best part is we don't even look at it as grind. It's we like what we are doing. Your pat, your yeah, passion. Exactly. I I was I was editing video yesterday at the kitchen table mm-hmm. and. My wife came over and she's like, "Why do you look so intense?" And I was like, "Oh, I was like I I needed this snippet of a of an interview that I had because he went like from one topic to another real mm-hmm. fast and so you've got to like pull it out into the like milliseconds yeah, yeah. to find the transition point to cut it and and I was trying to find that because it was like the same thing like uh, mm-hmm. uh, 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 uh. Yeah. There. There you go. and that it's intense i have fun doing yeah. it i love talking motorsports i could talk to you all day about what you do and turn the recording off and and get the real story but uh okay let's go way 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 yeah. way back how did you get started in this like how were you like a motorsports fan as a kid like what so all right how did so, you get here i think my story would be a bit different from others i would say who is into formula 1 and i'm i was not into formula 1 at all i was not into cars i was not into doing any sort of things related to cars so firstly i used to play sports so i was a big cricket player <laughs> when i was doing my childhood and i was a nerd as well on the same time so i still used to study i love physics whatever happened then when i was like what 16 years old or something i had to start my uni and that was the same time when i was playing my county level cricket so i had a chance of playing cricket for the county or studying because indian parents are being indian parents if you don't study you don't have a life so i had to move into studies which i didn't <laughs> which i didn't regret it because i like studying so i was like i don't mind 
I'll play cricket as a hobby or whatever it is. So I moved into university where I did mechanical engineering for my bachelor's back in India from SRM University. It's a place on the south side, south southern coast of India. So yeah, I just started mechanical engineering because I wanted to do aerospace. Do you know why? It's a very stupid reason. My grandfather used to be an engineer in railways. My father is an engineer in buses. My father's brother is an engineer in petrol and ships. So I was like, what is the odd one out? Planes. So I wanted to do aerospace. That was my whole reasoning behind why I wanted to do aerospace. Because I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what I, what I like to do. I wanted to play cricket. I wanted to do architecture for a bit. Then my dad was like, no. So I was like, yeah, engineering, let's do it. So <laughs> we wanted to join Mecca. Good advice, Dad. Yeah, good advice, Dad. Yeah, I always say that to him. So <laughs> I joined mechanical engineering because... So I wanted to join aerospace uh, in, in, in the same university. But my dad was like, aerospace is a narrow subject. Take mechanical engineering and do your master's in aerospace. Uh, so it's easy for you. And if you find something in between, you might you can change. But if you take aerospace right now, you're gone. I was like, cool, good advice again. So <laughs> did mechanic took mechanical engineering, and then because I was in a university which is like has thirty six thousand students, and it's a big uni, one of the biggest universities in India. So we have people from international all over India. I just wanted to. I'm a very social guy, so I just wanted to improve my social circle because I was living in a hostel over there. So I just started to join all these clubs, so student unions. I used to do debate competitions all over India. So I joined the debate society, like model UNs. The student unions played, started to play sports again. And then this was the practical, like the curric- extracurricular side of things. And then I was like, to get a job, there's this, form, there's this thing called formula student. So, and in my college, you had mm-hmm. like around nine to 10 different teams. And each team has a difference. So one team does formula student combustion. One team does electric. One team does ATV off-roads, off-road electric, solar, super mileage. Different, different teams for different, different competitions. So I was like, cool. I have to join one of the teams. So it's good on my CV so I can get a job easier. So I started to apply for the F formula student team called Camber Racing. I didn't get through. I, I So in India, you have to write an exam and then clear an interview to get into the team. So I didn't clear the exam for came for the formula student combustion, or any off-road teams, nothing. Like first four teams, gone. Like they were like reject, 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 reject because I didn't get the basic score. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, let me... So there was this workshop which came in for cars and they had just dismantled the engine. They showed us how an engine works and everything. So I was like, cool. They just gave me a book which says all the subsystems of a of a car. So for the next time when I went for a for a for an for an exam, I studied. I went through that. So I went through the sub, the book which that workshop gave it to me, and I've cleared two two teams. One was the Formula Student Electric, and one was the Super Mileage team. So I was like, cool. I went through interview, opened the book again. I was like, what do I like? Okay, brakes looks nice, chassis looks nice. Let's let's study that and go. Went through, cracked cracked the interview. Well and good. So I went, I got into the team. So I got into the super mileage team first. So I was like, I'll just stay here because I like the people. I like the seniors who have been working over there. Yeah. And then I still remember the first day when I entered the the room where people start sit and design and plan and everything. I never knew this thing called SolidWorks where you design something. I always thought you just manufacture and do this because I had zero knowledge. I went into this room and I saw this. What part were you working on? Oh, I was working on the, so I, this was my first day in the team. I had, I, I know, I know nothing about, like, I know literally li- okay. zero. I just walked into the room. I just turned my head okay. and there was this one guy just flipping around a solid model of a, like a wheel or something. And I'm like, it's so realistic. Like you can design something on this. So then I started, I started to like design that instant. Like in the next week, I down like started to learn SolidWorks, did everything I, I can to learn SolidWorks. And I just fell in love with design. So fell in love with design, did vehicle dynamics as well on the side. So when I was working with my super mileage team, so this is a bit of a different team rather than whatever you might know about formula student. So this team works on, mm-hmm. so we literally make cars which are super 
ultra efficient so our entire competition is how much mileage can you get out of an engine so for one liter how many kilometers can mm-hmm. you drive so we make a three wheeler vehicle which is like streamlined uh completely enclosed in a driver 50 cc engine calibre the engine as much as we can make it as light as we can and we we were like i mean the first time i went into the team we were really bad like we never cleared an endurance so i joined the design team saw what was happening we went to singapore and our car literally was bad like during testing our entire roll cage was bent like this because of the chain snaps so i realized the design was so bad and me and my senior who so i became the design lead in my third year after we came back from singapore so in my third year of uni i was the design lead started to do structural analysis started to do learning about materials and everything so we used the roll cage because we didn't have enough finances yeah then fell in love with design properly we made a car came second in india we gave like around what 140 kilometers per liter so in terms of miles it's like around like per, per liter of fuel you get like 100 miles or something else something like that so yeah wow and then moved into my final year fast yeah it is a bit it's very fascinating like to see how we make those cars so it is called shell eco marathon and it happens in asia america and europe so there's three different competitions and it started at regionals where it came to our own country so our team was this close of getting scrapped because in singapore we didn't perform and that was the third consecutive year where we actually failed to perform and give a, a mileage run so the team was this close to to get scrapped and in 2019 so we just started to design the next year car we were like let's see what's going to happen and all of a sudden shellico marathon puts an event in my city where my university was there saying shellico marathon india and we were like bro this is the competition that we need to win or need to perform just to get a mileage nothing else our only thing was make the car run for 6 for 8 kilometers around the track we complete endurance we get a mileage that's it no, no questions asked so so we, or, or the entire team put put in their own money we never we didn't get finances from college so we used our own money to build a car so everybody has put money from parents pocket money whatever they're doing put money into the car grinded hours like because in india you need to go uni from 8 to 5 every single day so we used to go you need 8 to 5 and the worst part is you need to attend a class because your attendance cannot be less than 75% or else you're failed so wow so when do you go to school if so if you if you're in the competition 8 to 5 no no you go to university from 8 to 5 and then okay. after 5 o'clock we go to the garage we go to the fabrication bay work until 2 in the morning and then sleep at 2 or 3 whenever okay, it is okay, okay. then wake up at 8 again just to the same routine <laughs> and where where did finance come into all this oh so do you just do you understand finances from having to build this thing or so did you get a minor in no, that no 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 there's no minors nothing it's just mechanical engineering but what happened so i used to do as i told okay. you i used to do debate competition so i used to do model united nations so every monday to friday my role was just working with the team saturday sunday travel across india to different debate competitions with the college so that was my piece of like get away from university and from this team team drama so I used to do a lot of moral un and i used to do economics and human rights as my main thing so economics started over there for me Okay, okay. Yeah. And then so where go on. Where did the passion for motorsports begin? Oh yeah, this so this was the time. So when I was in my third year because I was in a formula like a team, everybody started to watch Formula 1. So I was like, yeah, let yeah. me watch as well. It's just just this was the sake of it because I'm doing something. And then I just fell in love with it. I was like, bro, this is <laughs> and i never wanted to work in formula 1 per se i was like i wanted to do automotive in germany or whatever it is so in my fourth in my final year i was my team's captain like the technical director which is like a chief engineer role so 
one of my super senior from university from india came to oxford brooks to do motorsport engineering and then he told there is a shot of you getting into formula 1 through this university but it is very hard because of the visa situation because you don't get visas easily and you don't get into f1 because they don't sponsor you so i was like i don't know what i'm going to do in germany i don't like automotive that much because <laughs> i worked in daimler and volvo for a month and didn't like a bit of it because i i don't know for some reason production wasn't my thing and i was like bro i'm not working in automotive at all and then i found an escape route saying oh shit i can go to united <laughs> kingdom i can go to oxford brooks i can do formula 1 which i am kind of liking so i'll just take this as a challenge and make sure i get into formula 1 one day so that was my entire thing of getting into formula 1 just i took it up as a challenge where so where did where did you get this comp- did you get the competition from your parents no i don't know because i mean you're you're young guy yeah. like <laughs> Most most college kids have no idea what they want to do when they grow up, and I mean, you you kind of latched on to stuff really quick. Yeah, I mean, my dad is a big inspiration for me, like because he has given up so much in his life for me, just just for my sake, in terms of finances or whatever it is, because he never got a chance to study because his brother was doing his uh, bachelor's and my grandfather couldn't afford, so he just started to work. in a in the buses department for like the government at the age of 18 so and for a very low wage as well so when i was born he was he apparently told my mom saying that i didn't study whatever i'm experiencing at the age of 35 i could have done it in age of 22 but i couldn't i want him to study as much as he wants and whatever it is so i got this to know over my course of life and he is really really in term is it really good in terms of you know grasping something what you need in terms like he he doesn't do things randomly he's like okay do something you like do it religiously and just just don't let it go you will get it if you don't get it just keep trying and but the thing is you need to put in the effort he always says do it religiously that word is always in my brain <laughs> yeah so when i started to yeah it's a good job. yeah so when i started to when i did when i told him i'm going to do motor sports in oxford brooks he was like why because and did you answer it i mean i was like i want to do it and he's like are you sure and he didn't talk to me for a week <laughs> <laughs> because he is like motorsport yeah. is such a niche sector you said aerospace at the first you said automotive next now motorsports what is happening with you so he was a bit confused but then i convinced him that this is what i actually like in terms of so like this engineering that you don't get in automotive and this was like a challenge to me and this just felt right i was like i just need to do this no questions asked so i just applied got my got got my admission in oxford brooks made sure i just cleared all my subjects i was traveling around enjoying life until covid happened and then in 2020 when i graduated from india it was the peak season of covid and i didn't want to take a gap year and i was like no nope, i don't care i'm just going to university and my dad is like just leave as soon as you can whenever i got the visa i literally got my visa and literally one day later i took my flight and left good for you yeah and then came into brooks good for you yeah came into oxford brooks joined the formula student team over here then i so because in my previous team in my final year i was the chief engineer as well as i was looking into finances because i liked economics so that's when my interest in cost was mm-hmm. was started so i was in the budgeting bill of materials and all this stuff for my previous team came to oxford brooks and over here the formula student team has a specific competition called cost and manufacturing so it's literally like the cost cap but not with the money you need to explain them <laughs> how where are you spending money why are you spending this and yeah like this and that and i was the cost lead for that team as well as i was the composite manufacturing lead so that got me through and that made me fall in love with cost completely i just loved it it just I don't know out of 100 people one person likes cost and that was me 
it's 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 kind of a fascinating subject because I I like things that are dynamic. Mm -hmm. It's not just point A to point B. Yep. You know, it's very dynamic. It's you know other things globally and components affect the whole. It's kind of like how you described the team yep. environment at Mercedes was was really like everything is leading and trending and moving and trying to understand how one thing affects another mm -hmm. thing and and more or less trying to see the future yeah. a little bit. I, I really, I think economics is a really strong subject for people to get into because they start to see how one thing affects many things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not as simple as, you know, build the fastest race yeah. car. Okay. You know, make a social post go viral. Okay. It it's there's so much more to it. I think you get that from from that. And I, and I think Dan from Mercedes Powertrains mm -hmm. is the judge for that, yeah, isn't yeah. he? So Dan was okay. one of I think I think yeah, he's him? one of the judge for Formula Stewart in the UK, I believe, like a course judge. Which yeah. I will be in this year. Yeah. I th I believe I've so. also had Okay, so I've also had Catherine Richards mm -hmm. in your wind tunnel on the oh, show. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've seen the post. And yeah. she, you know, she's talked about the the Formula student as well and how they recruit out of that. And it's a, it's an amazing thing. I actually, I had my son listen to that show because he wants to be actually exactly what you described was go to school for mechanical engineering with, you know, kind of a maybe a minor in aerospace, yeah. but an understanding of that as well. And that's kind of his, his direction right now. And I told that to Dan and Dan's like, here, I'll send you all these connections. <laughs> and, like, and the formula student there, they call it, they call it formula SAE over oh, here. Oh yes. But, yes. You know, he, yep. um, he got real, real giddy when I told him that. And, you know, at the time I had a, on the other side of the screen here, I've got a, a desk mm -hmm. and he had pulled apart an engine. Yep. And was like, you know, if I get in the engine and I do this stuff, I can get five more horsepower out of it or something like that. And, you know, he just completely taking the thing apart. He's, it, he's just making your life he easy. Does when we go to bed. He just... <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> you, you, on a weekend, you know, he'll be up till, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning and I'll come downstairs and he will have something completely taken apart. You know, and like the TVs we have here, like he'll just start connecting stuff to him and it <laughs> he is he is an engineer yeah. so that'll be that'll be fun yeah but so are your parents fans of formula one now no so my mom doesn't watch formula one at all she doesn't understand why cars go around in circles and people watch it so i, I just leave her to what what that is and i just be like just you you don't say anything you just be happy my dad so me and my dad used to watch formula one like 2007 2008 that's what i've got to know that formula one exists that's when so i have a this weird Good story years. about like how i started watching f1 so when i was watching f1 alonso was like in his prime he just switched from renault to ferrari so i i, I remember watching two or three races that's it i didn't watch much with my brother with my with my cousin my father and everyone and then I, I, then I was like, oh yeah, Alonso was like my thing. Okay. I was like, okay, F1 is Alonso or Schumacher. That's it. Nothing else. So I liked, I had a soft okay. corner for Ferrari and Renault. And when I started watching in 2018, 19, I was like, okay, I'll support Ferrari or Renault because I, I watched Alonso 10 years ago, whatever it is. But then when I got to know, mm -hmm. I will join Oxford Brooks. That's, I have a shot in F1. I made a deal with myself saying I won't support a team until I work for a team. And yeah, and never in a million years, okay. I thought I would support Mercedes because before as a Ferrari fan, I was like, nope, not Mercedes at all. But now it's a different story. Yeah. Okay. So how did you get because you you had some roles prior to mm -hmm. mercedes what how how did 
how did you build up to this? Was there a, like a plan? I'm going to get a job and I'm going to slowly get into this or did you try things <coughs> before you? So like as soon as I was almost in the phase of graduating, starting to apply for roles. So ultimate goal was Formula One, but my main intention was to find a job in the UK so that I am settled in and then I can apply for different jobs. If it's F1, well and good. I don't, it's the best thing ever. But I, I was just applying for jobs over and over, getting rejections over and over again because there's a big situation with the visa and everything. So I think I applied for like 150 odd jobs or whatever. So before I got my first job interview, I got my first job interview in a go-karting company. They wanted me to start in August. I couldn't start until October. They were like, sorry, we can't do that. Then McLaren happened, couldn't get into McLaren. Uh, then I had Mercedes over here, like Mercedes Formula One uh, for a race team apprentice. And they told me that I was overqualified for the job because I was a master student going for an apprentice. And I'm like, I don't care, just give me the job. But they're like, no, you're overqualified. We don't want to do that to you. And then, <laughs> yeah, and then I got a job at this company called Lentus Composites because as I told you, for my formula student, I was working as a composite manufacturing lead and the cost lead. So I was doing composite design, composite manufacturing, like lamination and everything. And I joined in Lentus Composites as a manufacturing engineer. So it's a company where we make parts for Formula One, hypercars, supercars. So my main project was on Aston Martin Valkyrie, Mercedes Project One. So we make certain bits and bobs like the front wing, the radiator ducts, the rear wing for like certain cars and give it back to them. We make some parts for Formula One, Formula E, like the gearboxes and everything. So we get contracts, we make them, we give them back. And my role is developing what we have as a manufacturing process improving ply books, improving, improving, you know, the time required, like, it's just like development of a manufacturing process. That, that was my main role. And then four or five months into the job, I was like, okay, I like the job, but I didn't see any growth over there because of the management and that perspective side of things. And I wanted to leave, but I didn't want to leave for any other organization apart from F1, because I was like, this company is offering a visa after my two years of staying. Mm -hmm. So I'll stay here. I like what I'm doing. So I like the people over here. I'll stay here. I'll just apply for Formula One and just hope that I get a job. Until then, I'll just stay here. And then funnily enough, after like 10, 11 months of applying, I, I, I got rejected in like final rounds for Williams, Aston Martin, Mercedes, HPP, like three, three to four companies. And then... There were, there were moments I was there, bro, this is not going to happen. I'm not getting into F1 because all of my close friends work in F1. And seeing them one by one getting a job in F1, it breaks your heart. So you're like, okay, I can't cry in front of them, but internally, my, my best friend who works for Williams, he knows how, how much I actually like, cried in terms of I'm not able to get any interviews or whatever. But then, to be honest, to getting a job into F1... You, you, of course, you need the skill set, but you need luck as well. It's like it's a lot. That I'm like, as you're talking, this is not the first time I've heard actually this story almost word for word yeah. from other guests. I, I often wonder, you know, if if the recruiters for the teams just kind of sit back and you know they're like, oh, that was just their first application. You know, let's wait until we get their fifth application in here that, you know, when they when they figure out what my email address is and they start emailing me every single day, you know, that's the kind of passion that I want to see. And they just kind of sit and wait. Nah, I, I'll be I'll be I, very I, honest with this. There are some of my friends who literally got their job on their first application. And I'm like, bro, you are just lucky. <laughs> Then I'm yeah. wrong. Then I'm I mean, wrong. there are people who have got that, but so, I, and to be honest, I literally changed my email address just because I felt that I'm applying way too much. So I applied from a different email address. <laughs> <laughs> you're thinking outside the box. You're, you're starting to check all their yeah. boxes off in your process here. They're like, oh. uh, like my 
story of getting into F1, like my story of getting into F1 is really weird because when I first applied for this job, I got rejected. And then... For the one that you have now? Yep. So okay. when I saw this job for cost analyst, and I was like, yeah, I like this job. I do cost. Get a, get a, get away into F1, and this is good. So there were three roles which were open. So it said cost analyst, cost efficiency, cost analyst, inventory, cost analyst, like general. So I just applied for the cost efficiency thing, and I just submitted my application. Uh, so I emailed a guy called uh, Robbie, who was my manager. So I emailed him on LinkedIn saying, I applied for this job. Can you look into it or whatever? And he's like, see, I can't talk to you about it. Apply first, and then I'll look at your application, and then we'll talk. I'm like, cool. I applied the night at 10 o'clock in the night. The next morning at 7 in the morning, I get a rejection saying, you have been rejected from this application. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> so I, email, I messaged Robbie on LinkedIn again. I'm like, I got rejected. Can I get any feedback or whatever? He, he never replied. And I'm like, cool, I can't do anything about it. Then I just saw a post saying last day for applications for cost analyst. So the last, the other two jobs, which, which were open. So the inventory and operations and the normal one, I just took the same application, just posted it, just sent it out. And I'm like, cool, I can't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So it was like Monday. And then Friday, I get a call saying you have an interview for the inventory and operations for cost analyst. I'm like, that's nice. Gave an interview. I had an online. So this was during uh, the Hungary GP. Okay. So I went, I was going to Budapest towards the F1 race. So this was, I was leaving on the Wednesday. I had an interview on Tuesday evening. So literally six to six thirty was my interview. I had to leave to the airport by eight o'clock in the night. So this was literally at that point of time, I gave my interview to like a couple of my managers, a couple of the guys over there. And then they were like, yeah, cool. We'll just let you know. I wasn't, I was at the airport checking my, uh, normal just on my phone. Robbie messages me back saying, oh, I heard that you had, uh, an interview with my colleagues. I hope it went well. Uh, let me know if you have any doubts or something. I'm like, cool, man. Or whatever. I'll, I'll let you know what. And then it just went through, went through, went through. Saturday during qualifying, I get a call saying you have a second interview now. And I'm like, oh, shit, this is actually pretty sick. I actually have an interview. And they were like, can you come on Monday? I'm like, no, no, I'm coming from Budapest. Can I come on Tuesday? So I'm like, they were like, cool. You have to be as soon as possible because Friday is the last day because we have shut down from Monday. So they're not working for two weeks and they want to complete the entire process by Friday, which means Tuesday was my only option. Came back, went to the interview. And my interview was with Robbie, the guy who was mes whom I was messaging to. So my interview was the same position, cost efficiency, which I got rejected for the first. <laughs> and then during the interview, when I was going through stuff, he, he got, so even he did composite design for like solid 10 years of his life and always a senior cost analyst. So when he got to know I do composites, he was like, there is a position which is like after all my, all, most of my interview was going through. He was like, there is actually a position which is open for composite design in the next two months. But if you want it, we can give it to you right now. And I was like, I mean, not, not right now. They were like, if you want it, we will prefer you or whatever. He put it in a very subtle way. So I was like, yeah, this would be my ideal role because I love composites. I love cost. This would be my ideal, like perfect role. And then literally two days later, I get a call saying, yeah, yeah, you got the job. I'm like, I literally, to I was in my car driving. I literally told the HR, am I allowed to scream? And she was like, yes, you're allowed. I literally was honking my car on the middle of the road. <laughs> did, did they ever tell you why they rejected you for this? Role? Oh, so I asked, was it like a font error? Yeah, it was actually an error. <laughs> <laughs> so any young people listening, most, most online applications are scrubbed. Mm -hmm for um, check boxes, yep. you know, do they have these qualifications, these degrees, these keywords. And so if it does not filter through the system, it gets rejected mm -hmm. automatically. So I, I always encourage young people, if, 
if they believe that they're a fit for something to just, you know, I mean, I'm self-employed, but I have like four variations of a resume yep. or a CV and, you know, and I probably have five or six variations of a cover letter, just standard stuff to fit different molds if I ever need to use them for those particular yep. reasons. So I, I love stories like that where it's like, this is the job I wanted. I'm totally qualified for it. I'm in rejected. Yeah. <laughs> and then you come back and they're like, you're perfect for this role. <laughs> like even the same, like I so don't ever, don't ever take. Yeah. I mean, for me as well, I, I was applied, like, okay. I was like, okay, I have these many applications to fill. I, I had design. So I did aero as well. So I was like design, aero, cost, structural, whatever I could find. So I had different, different resumes, just popping them one by one here and there. Just getting the job description, changing keywords, changing cover letters for every single resume. And I had like what, 450 to 500 applications before I got this job. So it's just a grind. Yeah, don't don't ever take it personal. It's the best advice I've ever gotten in job hunting is never take the process personally unless they say, you know, Ryan, I just don't like you, yeah. <laughs> you know, which they'll never say that. But so in in all your time, like you've been in, obviously you're in F one mm -hmm. now. You've also been in some pretty high level projects. I mean, Valkyrie, that's a pretty high level project. Project One, that's another big Mercedes project. What, what's been your pinch me moment in all of this besides screaming in the car with the <laughs> HR rep? Like what? Oh, pinch me moment. I mean, by the way, I would have done the same. Yeah, I was, I was so gassed. I was like literally during the call when they were telling me like, okay, you got the job. They were telling me, these are your bonuses. These are whatever benefits you get. And I'm like, I don't care. Like I got the job. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think the pinch me moment was, I mean, I think it was literally like after my university at Brooks, when I first got, I mean, getting a job in a company, it's not even a big company, it's still a medium sized organization, but, uh, getting a job in a company which produces stuff for Aston Martin or like Valkyrie or project one. And when I first time when i actually went in they were like there's a valkyrie wing in front of you you can hold it if you want this is like during my interview they were giving me the company tour and i'm like can i hold it and they're like yeah yeah go on i'm like yeah that that's when i was like oh actually i'm actually here like this might be it when i was like <laughs> when i i knew for a fact the interview went well and i'm like okay this is the stepping stone of whatever i've done until now so that was like the start and the second pinch me movement is literally when the first day at Mercedes, I was at the reception, just taking my ID card, Toto Wolf walks in, he looks at me and is like, good morning. I'm like, what do you mean? Good morning. Like I, I was just shocked. I'm like, why is he saying good morning to me? <laughs> <laughs> you totally missed the accent on that. Yeah. <laughs> So what, now, now that you've gotten in, what didn't you expect? So like, what, <coughs> what was a, what's been a surprise to you about being on the inside now? I mean, the thing was, I always got a bit of insight from F1 because many of my close friends work in F1. So I get a bit of understanding how F1 works. So we literally, all of my friends and us, we literally call it, it is just formula student with more money. As easy as it sounds. So we were like, I mean, I'd never had any expectations in terms of what needs to be done or what, like what I would expect, but it was just like the sheer amount of work that goes on to a car. It's actually incredible. Like the number of days, the number of hours people work into things keeping their work-life balance intact amazes me a lot. Like I always had this thing in my brain that people are just keep working, nothing else in life, doing nothing else, only work. Yeah, it was just vanished. I was like, what is happening? Why are people so chill? Why are people so happy? I mean, like, not happy in the sense, just enjoying whatever they're doing and enjoying off, off work. Right. That just 
like gave me a good sense of understanding that I can enjoy my life while still in F1. I think that like I think going back to what your you know your dad kind of buried into you was you know wanting you to find that thing that you're passionate about because I know me personally you know anything that I'm passionate about I will I mean I will grind to the core to see it through and I enjoy it you know, I won't sleep. I will, you know, wake up. I will cry. I will whatever it takes to to see that thing out. And I think you're witnessing that at, at scale. You're not at a startup where like five people in the company are super excited about this project. You're at a company and a team of a thousand people that are all equally passionate and just having the time of their life because just just like you everyone that i've talked to there was like a moment in life where they're like i want to be in formula one and so they're like a thousand people that have achieved the objective and like have achieved a dream and they're living the dream out and i think that that's that's really really cool to continue because I'm, I'm waiting for the one who is like the guest that comes on the show that's like I don't know. Somebody just called me and was like, you want to be in Formula <laughs> One? And I was like, sure. Um, you know, I show up. It's a grind. It sucks. And, you know, but it pays well. Like, maybe I'll, I don't think I'll run into that person. Yeah, that's true. That, I don't think you will ever find a person. I mean, you might, to be honest. I'm, 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 I might be wrong, but yeah, I, I never encountered a particular person who is like, oh yeah, I mean, I just got it just because for the sake of it. I mean, there are people because there are a lot of people yeah. who have come from different streams. They just randomly applied and now they end up in F1. And they don't even know what F1 was until they actually came into the team. I have met them. I have met those people, like a couple of them. So it's not that there are, there are people who don't even know what's F1 just applied because they applied. And then they're like, oh shit, actually, we are actually in F1. Yeah. Like some, most of the people not like engineering side of things, people know 99% of the people know that it's F1, but I think the more marketing technique, like the or, or non-technical side of things where people just come from different, different companies and they apply to these kind of companies out of nowhere and then just get a job. And then they realize, oh shit, there's actually a big magnitude motorsport than we, what we expected. So you find those people as well. And they're all just as excited as oh, you are because yeah. I've had social media people on the show and they're just like, they get to thrive in the glitz and glam side, which I imagine it's not like that internally, but it, you know, they get to thrive on the drama, drive to survive yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the fandom and <laughs> yeah, that's always there though. I mean, everything has its own perks. We get to design a car. So we are happy about that. They get to enjoy what we do. So they're happy about that. I think that's the, the beauty in, in these conversations is, you know, I, I think Drive to Survive does a phenomenal job of showcasing drivers and team principles and the sport in and of itself. And fans finally can connect with the sport because it's not a helmet and a race car and, you know, a really complicated set of rules. But they get to see, you know, how how does how does Rashad, how does a guy at Mercedes keep this cost cap under control and not spiral out. How does a guy like Dan develop a car for 2026? You know, who I, I would have never guessed that all teams besides the enormous amount of publicity that Audi has had that they, you know, that they're working on the 2026 20, engine, but like there's, it's already in process yeah, with is. you guys, you know? And I, and I think that that's, that's something fans don't, can't fathom because they don't think that far in the future but to to hear your story hear other people's stories they they just like they dig into the sport as fans but they also like you know myself i tell people all the time one day i'll work in formula one obviously my kids will have to have gone off to college <laughs> and be able to pay their own bills but you know i'm i'm here i'm being a dad right now but eventually you know, I've, I've got to find a way in and for now, this is how I do it. And 
and that's it. But there's always a door. There's always a path. And, and I, I love stories like yours where you, you know, you showcase that. What, what advice do you have for young people? Uh, like imagine yourself having a conversation with your dad wondering, what do I do? I would like to put this one story out before I tell what I actually have advice out. So as I told you, I okay. got to like automotive. So my dad had me to get to this internship in Volvo buses in production. So it was a reputed, it's a big reputed organization. I went into the company, went for my first, second day of my, my, my internship. Uh, I, and I, and I didn't like it. I literally left the internship on the second day and I never went back. My dad <laughs> was so pissed because he talked to many of his seniors to get me an internship over there. And he was, and I just left without even telling him. And I was in a different city and I just booked tickets and I just went back to my hometown and my dad is like, what, what, what are you doing? But then eventually I realized there is like, so my dad never built, that's why my dad didn't talk to me for one week when I told I was going for motorsport engineering because he believes I will just juggle it out and leave. But for some reason it just felt right. Like I'm all, I'm always that kind of person like even about financially or whatever decisions I take in life. I think about it twice and thrice. And then like, I still had like bad moments in my life and there was this through whatever I've learned. I always got to know this, that things always happen for a good reason, but you just need to wait for it to understand why is it good. You don't get it instantly, like in a month or a year, it might take multiple years or it might take two days. My advice literally to young kids is like they, it's, it's literally all about if you're passionate about something, just go for it. Like, of course it will take time. It will, your parents will say no, your friends will say no, they'll say that you're dumb or whatever it is. But if you put in the effort, and as my dad says, if you put in the effort religiously, like religiously being the key word over here, it's, I mean, I wouldn't say you will achieve whatever you, you dream of, but you will be happy whatever you're doing. Like, even though it's not Formula One, like when I was in my previous company, just laminating bits for Valkyrie, I was still happy. Even though I was get getting paid a bit like less or whatever it is, I was still happy with my life. I was still happy with whatever I'm doing. My mom says, go to computer science. You would have earned a lot of money. I'm like, yeah, but I don't like computer science. Like if you like something, then yeah, just, just, just do it. Like things will get better if you put in the effort. Don't expect results if you don't if you don't put any efforts. Put in the effort, something or the other will show up by the end. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer. I, we have a very entrepreneurial family, and we're all self-employed. And you know, we we worked really really hard to get here. And and I always tell people because everybody makes the startup world look really cool and hip and fun. It's kind of like formula yeah, one, it is. you know, like it's got this facade of yeah. cool, coolness and glitz and glam. And it's really, it's a ton of work and, you know, a lot of sleepless nights and, and, but because we're passionate about it, we're willing to have sleepless nights. We're willing to work really, really hard for that. And you just like, it puts you into a different gear when you're passionate and maybe not even passionate, but you just really enjoy what you're doing. And, and I, I, you're a perfect example of that. Like you've done nothing but smile this whole <laughs> thing, talking about your story and you know, it, it's really cool. I seriously, I, I really appreciate you coming on here. I, I Mercedes has actually been, um, one of the most kind of open door, um, teams that I've come across mm -hmm. so far and everybody has been really, really great. You know, Aston Martin's been another one. Uh, Williams has been really good as well. All Mercedes powered <laughs> teams, but like, I just, I really appreciate you doing that. Cause it does take a lot for somebody to come on and talk to a computer and a camera and a stranger they've never met before and like tell their story and, uh, I know people will resonate with that and, and I hope that you get a lot of uh, credit for that 
for doing that. And Rashad, man, thank you for coming thank on. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. You, uh, you guys have uh, big plans for next year. I mean, everything I've seen in the news since Brazil has been um, a three-way fight next year. I mean, and... I, I, I believe so because, quite honestly. Like, like I've never seen a race win. No, I mean, of course, because I've only been in the company for the last three, three and a half months or so, or so. So it's fairly new to me. So I never experienced what a race win looks like, and people over here in Mercedes never experienced what a race win this year looks like. They've been experiencing race wins over and over, and it was a normal thing for them. But I'm happy. I'm kind of happy that Mercedes didn't win, and until now, until I came in and I got to experience something which they all experienced after one year, after all the hard work because that day the Monday which I went after Brazil the office atmosphere was incredible like everybody was smiling everybody had a, everybody had a smile on their face everybody just cheering around everybody comes to, comes to people saying congratulations and I'm like wait, this is actually really cool like I have contributed something to that car, even though it's zero point one person. I it still feels weird that I have contributed something. And when we had we had a debrief with Mike Elliott, a technical director, where he was talking about how things have been and what we have done, and everybody had champagne, everybody wore this T-shirt, like the winners T-shirt. And when everybody raised the glasses, I think that was a goosebump moment, saying, "If you like." That's why the sport makes it worth it. Like when you win, it 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 just feels so good in terms of that whatever you whatever you're putting in has an output, and there's this entire boost of emotions that come out. I think that's what Formula Student has given to me. That when you see your car first time running, that you have designed on your own, I've literally cried when I've seen my own design over there. Like like a car designed which a part a car a designed a part in in a, in CAD seeing it run perfectly or whatever it is seeing it run i literally cried the first time i was like i was i was bursting in tears because the car didn't run until like 4 30 5 30 in the morning at 7 in the morning the engine finally ran nothing broke apart we did one lap properly and everyone my entire team who have been working for like two days straight without any any sleep everybody fell into tears because we were like bro we made this car work like we we saw her run so, yeah, it is just, yeah, it's just incredible because you put all of these elements together, teamwork, parts and everything together, and you see this incredible piece of machinery going around the lab, around the circuit, where millions of people watching. Yeah, it it it, it, it feels nice. It feels nice. It's rare. Yeah. I mean, in, in all reality, you know, I, I think people forget how, you know, Haas has never won a race before, you know, it's like, it's rare. And I, and I think, you know, people that have been around the sport realize how rare that is and special that is. I think fans don't all the time, you know, it's like the expectation is if you're a big name, if you're a popular name, you win. And, and I mean, Russell was at Williams, not winning or scoring points for three yeah. years. And, you know, I, <laughs> You see that you you see that young guy cry oh, all yeah. the time when he scores points or win. <laughs> like yeah. that's that's really really yeah. hard to get there. So. Of, what, and you have you have a like go ahead. yeah my, my my close friend's girlfriend she works for McLaren. So when they had uh, Danny Ricardo's and Norris's P one P two in Italy, I asked her like how was the atmosphere. She's like, bro, we were drinking for one week. Like, we were literally celebrating for one week. You don't know. It was so incredible in terms of what's happening, what's not happening. It's, yeah, it, it's, I, lo I love this sport just because, like, it's the same as Formula Student where everybody comes together, work on one car, makes it happen, and compete for that win. Yeah, it's just, it's just harmony. When, you, when I put it that way, it's just harmony that, and everybody's smiling all the time. Everybody's smiling. Everybody's talking to each other. Everybody is there. For, like people are there for each other. Like my, when I first went in, everyone helped me like to get up to speed. 
when if I had any doubt, people were like, "Don't worry, I'll sit with you." They took the time off for like one hour, two hours, how much ever time, how much ever time it is. Gave that respect to me, saying that, "Okay, I'll teach you." Even though you ask dumb questions, I'll be there. Even though it's Formula One, they still are down to earth. It's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, isn't it? Isn't it? It's it's almost like there are these these I don't know what you combinations or scenarios within teams where you like you there was so much there like you know. Hamilton and Alonso at McLaren in 2007, like that might have been one of the most excited years that I've had in the sport was like, you know, Lewis is the only driver I've ever watched the entire season of GP2 was when he was in that. I haven't watched it since, you know, I've caught some of the stuff on F1 TV, but you know, there was so much in that that like that lineup and that team and everything around that, you know, and then, you know, Vettel at Ferrari, Alonzo at Ferrari, like where you're just like, Oh, come on. Like, just get it done. Like Ricardo at McLaren, like seriously. Yeah. You couldn't have gift wrapped a better marketing package for anyone. And it is really, really incredible to see what, what's happening. What we do. It's, I mean, I, I just have no words. It's, it just puts a smile on my face. I can literally keep talking about this for hours and hours and just be happy about it, whatever I do. I can lit- I literally tell to people, like, I love what I'm doing. Like, I love my job. I have a good work-life balance. I work, I play sports, I play cricket, I play badminton, I do climbing with all of my mates. It's, it's, it's really good. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's good. <laughs> Living the dream, man. <laughs> Well, Richard, seriously, thank you for coming on the show. I want to respect your time. I I gotta I gotta bump out of here too. So <laughs> I I appreciate it. You are always welcome on the show when you get the next promotion and a whole new role. Come back on the show and tell us what that what you're yes, doing. Yes, please. I, I will do that. I will do that for sure. And if I land by any case in the US, I'll let you know that and come to your show and do it in life. Yes, yes. I. I've got this whole crazy cool experience now when I when I, I went to Coda for the first time and I've had a, a lot of guests on the show and I'm like texting them while I'm here. You know, of course I can't get anywhere on the paddock, mm-hmm. but it's really cool to text the people that you see on TV while they're in that environment and just kind of like connect with them. While you're not really connecting with them, you are yeah. connecting with them. Maybe maybe there's something there for Formula One to for fan engagement, but like to me, that's always been really neat to be like, hey, yeah, good job. Yeah, I mean, eventually yeah. you can just start podcast in every F1 race, just go to the race, bring people in. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna need Toto's money behind <laughs> me to do that. So, <laughs> I mean, but Put in a good word. I, I would do it, but the cost cap is hindering me, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Just next time you see Toto, be like, hey, you know, this is a really good podcast. We need we need this guy following us around the season. So. Brilliant. I'll do that. This will yeah. be the next. Hook him up. In your this will be the next drive to survive. There you go. There you go. That's that's what I mean. I'll call that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have them for you. Yeah. No, no, let's go to Amazon Prime. Netflix has its thing. For sure. Okay. Okay. You got it. Seriously, man, thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for having me. I would just keep talking for us, but I think there's a time limit for all of this.